Okay, well, we're here um, as friends um, to reinvent your friendship or <laughs> philia, um, to use the Greek word. Yeah. Which is a deeper word. That means, you know, I think it means sacred friendship uh, in some sense. Yep. And um, I wrote an article a while, a long time ago about, about this subject and I rewrote it. I sent it to you guys, but I, I think the, the, um, the thesis is, is really that, that friendship is, is not a commodity, uh, that it's sacred, that it's a vulnerable thing, that it's, it's risky. It's, it's not something cheap that can be, mm -hmm. you know, uh, um, bought and sold on, on social media. And, and uh, so I tried, to, I tried to write down my article in 10 sentences, but the first sentence was, uh, friendship is how we steal the culture. <laughs> um, um, because that sort of makes sense to me. Would you, would you agree with that, John, because you're the originator of that, of that phrase? Um, I uh, think so. Um, I, I mean, so for me, philia captures two terms um, that we should maybe try to bring into discussion together. It obviously captures fellow, uh, it captures friendship, like you said, uh, but uh, the, the invocation of the stealing of the culture um, also invokes the model I was using, which was uh, Christianity in the period of late antiquity. And then the, and then the notion I want to bring in is the Christian notion of fellowship, uh, where fellowship, um, right, is not, it's not the same. It's not to be identified with friendship, but nor can you keep it distinct. Um, and philia covers both. I think philia is the love that emerges out of and is in the care for Things that are self-organizing, that are living, that are living, and and, and so the, the Christian notion of fellowship was the philia that emerged out of and sustained the body of Christ, right? Uh, the church as the body of Christ. So and and the matter and of course bodies are self-organizing. They're they're autopoetic. They're self-making, living things. And and, and so philia uh, and insofar it was, as it was associated also with um, wisdom is that there's the sense of the community, like the school. Right, because uh, Pythagoras coins the term, and he simultaneously founds a community, a school, right? Where so there's fellowship. Out of the school emerges, right, a kind of love, right? That uh, it emerges out of the community, but it also sustains the community as its organizing principle, as its logos. And then it, it, it is, but it's not just self-organizing. It's like a living thing. It is directed towards something. It is the philia for Sophia, the the the, mm. the love of wisdom. And so I, I think that uh, if we could bring um, that notion of fellowship, the Pythagorean uh, Christian notion, if you'll allow me that, mm -hmm. into Aristotle's notion of friendship as the idea of a suke in two bodies so that the bodies get a self-organizing principle, a shared life between them, like the bodies of the, peop like the people in the church. Um, oh, that's there, wonderful. I think there's, yeah, yeah there, I think there's a profound uh, uh, discourse that we could open up there between oh. that Aristotelian idea and, and the Pythagorean Christian idea of sort of friendship, fellowship. Uh, yeah. So and I, fellowship, I think, I think, fellowship is about a quest too, which that's what came. Yes. To my mind. Yeah, the fellowship of the ring. I'm, I'm thinking exactly. of the fellowship of the ring, and it's it's a quest. So that's that's another dimension uh, of friendship which I I hadn't considered. And that's very much within the Pythagorean tradition. Because for Pythagoras, you were on a quest for wisdom, literally a soul flight towards wisdom. Um, and, and so, and that's where that, he really gave uh, mythological teeth to the uh, notion of wisdom as a, a, a profound kind of self-transcendence. So the questing, I, I, I thank you for bringing that out, Andrew. That's exactly also intended in things like the Fellowship of the Ring. And, and so I've been thinking a lot about, you know, Eros as the love that comes out of and uh, nurtures emergence, mm -hmm. philia as the love that emerges out of and nurtures self-organization, and then agape as the love that um, that that comes from and and helps sustain the way things emanate. Uh, to, you know, uh, and so I've been, I've been really playing with sort of the, the metaphysical correlations of the three kinds of love mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. And so, I, 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 that's, that's the final thing I want to say, um, and then I'll let you guys respond. Is so I'm trying to bring the Pythagorean Christian, the Aristotelian, and then this final notion, you might call it the, uh, the Neoplatonic or dialectic, of seeing philia as the important uh, uh, mediation between eros and agape. 
as well. Okay, great. Yeah, I was sort of thinking that this conversation we could focus on, on Philly, uh, maybe. But but uh, if if we if we bring in all three, that, that that's okay as as well, of course, because because everything is very interconnected. Well, I I do uh, want to uh, focus on Philia, yeah. but I, what I'm saying is I think there's these three aspects to it, and I think they're all related: yeah. the, the Aristotelian aspect, the Pythagorean Christian aspect, and what we might call the dialectic or Neoplatonic aspect of it. Great. I'm glad you brought in the um, the the Aristotelian notion of the shared the shared suke because that's yeah. something that then is developed I think further developed in Christianity. Augustine I think uses some of the same language. What does suke mean? The, 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 Can you tell us what suke means? For soul, our in this sense. So in soul, I see. Okay. Yeah. It also yeah. It, it sort of covers soul and mind. It's in the word psychology. Psyche. Right? And, yeah. And it, yeah. And, it, and it also means uh, that psyche. about you which is self moving. So yeah. it, it also. It's part of this self-moving, self-organizing. So it's sort of soul and psyche mixed together as a dynamic principle of, of some kind. Yeah, yeah. basically. Mm, okay. And that, that maybe too opens the door to add one more dimension to what you've just said, John, which is that to understand friendship, authentic friendship, and maybe later on we can also talk about maybe make some distinctions between authentic yeah. and inauthentic friendship, because oh, I think please. that would be probably a very mm. fruitful territory yeah. for us to venture into because our the landscape is rife with inauthentic friendship. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's very important for us to qualify what we mean by that. But I think that the, there's a, uh, a dimension of Socratic self-knowledge and the pursuit of genuine and reciprocal authentic oh, friendship. I, I, because I, I, friendship, authentic friendship, I think makes manifest the, the, the realization that one cannot know without being known in return. Mm -hmm. The project of knowing and being known are conjoined projects, yeah. and the conjunctive nature of those of those projects is something that is only realized in deep friendship, in philia. So, couldn't you put the two together then? I mean, I, I, what I'm thinking of is uh, sorry to interject, but maybe you can riff on this then, right? The idea that you know the friend friends are each other's divine double, um, because that you get the sense of the shared suke, because the divine double is right the, the same suke in two bodies or two locations and there's an aspirational relationship to them yes but you also get the pythagorean quest right the, the aspirational quest um between two people yes yes exactly the friend the friend becomes a symbolic thou by whom you pursue your authentic self right and um and to whom you pursue your authentic self too right because you're also affording them the same thing that's right. That's right. Because the, the, if I can use the, you know, that we often use, especially when we're talking about dialogue, we often use the, the fire metaphors, the metaphors yeah. of the campfire. And so maybe to reintroduce that a little bit, the, the, the light that is kindled in the virtue of friendship is the light by which you uncover yourself. Yes. Right. And without which you cannot un uncover yourself. Um, and so I think that, so understanding the project of self-knowledge almost in a meiotic way of, of uncovering recollectively that of yourself, which is not yet known to you. Uh, there seems to be a, a deep necessity of friendship in the cultivation of that project. Um, and then the other thing I might throw in too, you know, you, I, I remember you said something actually to me, John, um, a long time ago. And then I read something similar, I think in, in Seneca, um, Seneca has a has an epistle on friendship, and and he says something quite beautiful. It's very similar to something you once said to me, and then proceeded to live out, incidentally, um, which is that the the a, a friend is one against whose death you stake your life. Yeah. And now we could we could think of that literally, of course, but we could also think of death as the the soul's despair. Yeah. And I yeah. to me that's a little bit more of a helpful way of thinking about it. So I might say something yeah. like. Friend, a friend is what is a soul against whose despair we stake our life. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there is a sense in which a real, the cultivation of a real friendship, when you, when you, you're, you're at a real friend, a real friend is someone in whose fate you implicate yourself. Yeah. A soul who, in whose fate you become implicated, well, vol voluntarily implicated. And who brings you, uh, who lifts you up from despair uh, at, at the same time, right? 
Yes, yeah, with well, whom yeah. you despair and with whom you recover, and, 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 and who yeah. you also despair They're from. With. Yeah. yeah. So there's yeah, mm, that's so beautiful. Yeah. So the, the, you're picking up on the one of the essential features of the the suke is the the self knowing, the self caring, and then that gets extended uh, through another person. Um, that's right. They become conjunctive. Right? They become conjunctive. And that I think that also serves maybe to, to connect up to the insight that um, in, in a way that that friendship has that mediatory function between, you know, the, the knowing and the being of oneself and the knowing and being of, of, of the world writ large, mm-hmm. right? The countenance of one and the countenance of the world are, are reconciled or resolved in the relation of friendship. Yeah, because the, uh, so you're saying something like the friendship is where we get the second person perspective that mediates between the first and the third person perspectives. We, That's we right. And forms the bind and there and thereby forms the religio, the binding. The vow or, yeah. yeah. And it's an interesting thing because it's always perplexed me um, phenomenologically because uh, obviously linguistically, conceptually, we have the first and second and third person forms. We, that's, that's indisputable. And, and we're, we're picking up on something that has some sort of phenomenological functional basis. I get that. But like, as a phenomenological exercise, it's very easy. Like, like if you're sitting in meditation, for example, you can adopt the first person perspective, sort of this here now, or you can adopt the third person perspective, no one, nowhere, no when. But what is it, you, like, what is it you're doing when you move into the second person perspective? It's this weird stereoscopic thing where you're looking out through your eyes but you're also looking back through the through the, 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 the beloved other, right? And yet those are somehow fused into a unified perspective. The second person perspective is a very odd, right. like I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get us to remember before we were in Ventio, the strangeness and the oddness. Mm-hmm. Uh, in, in comparison to the first person perspective and the third person perspective, the second person perspective is very, very odd indeed. Very, very odd indeed. And I want to, I want to see how that the the weirdness of the second person perspective, the way the way it binds the two others together. So there's a way in which it binds the first and the third person perspective, as you said, Chris. And then I want to bring back what I was saying. There's something about friendship, fellowship, the way it binds us into something that takes on a life of its own, right? So a friendship. A, a friendship isn't. There's a sense in which both people. That's the analogy to. Dialogos, a friendship draws people like a friendship takes on a life of its own and it leads both of its members or more than two people, right? There's, joint, there's more, you know, friendships larger than that, right? But it leads them place it, it, like it takes on a life of its own and it, it takes, that's what happens. I mean, that's the myth of the fellowship of the ring. They form and the, the like fellowship. the Holy Spirit. It's the, yes, right? like the, Holy yeah, Spirit. the, the third, yeah, the yeah, divine yeah. double, the Holy Spirit. Yeah, that's right. The, the, All of the these things, act. it brings this third element in, doesn't it? That, 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 that. Why do you say it's weird, John? What's the weirdness? Is it, is it just because, um, because if you're, if you, you could, well, here, you're not reflecting I mean. on yourself, you're, you're this isolated, let's say, um, atomistic. And you, like if you're meditating and, and you don't have that sense, Perhaps it becomes a sterile exercise. Um, it, it could, and, and if you and if you don't have and also and and you you're just there has to be this 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 devotional sense in some sense to to another another principle higher principle it could be a person or not. Otherwise, I think you're stuck in the I it relationship and you don't get into the thou. Um, oh, I, I I I acknowledge all of that, Andrew. Yeah. What I meant what I meant in weird is uh, let me try and articulate it in terms of the grammar of our assumed metaphysics. Okay. First person perspective maps onto subjectivity. Third person perspective maps onto objectivity. Mm-hmm. What does a second person perspective map onto? Yeah. N- neither and, and both and, and yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah, well that's what I've been trying to get with this notion of transjectivity. The transjectivity, yeah. Yeah, your, and uh-huh. so friendship, yeah. friendship is one of our most powerful ways of inhabiting and disclosing the trans, uh, transjectivity as something of equal standing, and I think even more primordial standing because of the way it mediates and grounds subjectivity and objectivity. And, right. and I think because our culture, and this is one of the things I've been arguing for quite a while, right? Because our culture doesn't speak about transjectivity at all, very much, 
I think it, 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 it is largely at, at its metaphysical depths incapable of speaking about the grounding of friendship. Okay, so we have the sacred notion of friendship, which we, we've been exploring, and then we have the profane uh, aspect yeah. of friendship, which is, you know, everywhere today. Uh, it's, 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 it's been reduced to, its, to a commodity. It's been reduced to a, a kind of casual notion where everybody you associate with is, is, is your friend uh, uh, on some level. And it, it's, it's become something that people, you know, Facebook makes billions of, of dollars, you know, on this notion of, of friend. So, so um, can, can, you, can you explore those both? Can you guys explore those two aspects and the difference between them? But, um, but I think it follows on what I was just saying. Yeah. I think because we don't, uh, because we've lost the connections between friendship and fellowship, and because we we've lost the the metaphysical home in transjectivity for friendship, yeah. I, I think I think it's very difficult for us to get to the depths of friendship. So and friendship becomes just a casual relationship where you kind of get your rocks off with your. your I, I think level, friendship. You, you're not building well, towards this something, or, or you're not creating a. A symphony together or <laughs> something like well, that you know yeah i i, I mean I, I i mean when you when you don't have a grammar that takes you into ontological depth perception you're going to de you're going to degrade and default to the lowest common denominator and what is the lowest common denominator well it's 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 human association we associate mm -hmm. and and we used to we used to have more fine-grained distinctions so i mean i, I I understand what Chris meant by inauthentic, but what I mean is we used to have authentic categories that were non-friendship categories. There were, you, there were literally your associates. Uh, acquaintances. There, yeah. there, there were your acquaintances, and there yeah. were your associates, and there were your colleagues, and these were not understood to be friends, nor should they be friends. And then we got the weird sitcom thing that happened where now everybody is your family and everybody is your friend. And it's like, well, no, I don't want that because that removes the distinctness of friendship. I, I, I want people that are good colleagues, and I, I will appreciate them as good yeah. colleagues, but I don't want them to be my friend, and I want people who are my acquaintances. And, 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 we, and we, we even invented a new term um, in modernity, uh, or recently, that I thought captured an another category, that you had the buddy. And the buddy isn't a friend, and that's one of our biggest mistakes. The buddy is somebody that you do fun things with. They're your buddy. Like they're your, they're your hey, there's my rollerblading buddy, right? And that and that that's fine because again, right? We um, we're not we're not trying to legislate the relationships. But what we've done be, again because we lack, lack the ontological depth perception is all those distinctions have collapsed, and that is uh, adulterated, adulterated and confused our understanding. So that we have this, well, as you said it, this profane notion of friendship, because it is a notion that is muddied and equivocal and has lost the important intelligibility that all those distinctions gave us. If I can be like, uh, bring this down to something like, uh, you know, for, for, for men, for example, friendship is, is, is beer and, and, and football, you know, and, and for, and whereas it used to be church, um, yes. You know, yes. in, in a sense, yes. Yes. I, I don't go to church, and and I I don't want to become a Christian, but I prefer the church thing to to the beer and football, you know, the alcohol and and yeah. uh, and and sports uh, thing. Uh, just just almost that's like the masculine aspect of friendship because it's interesting because like philia it means brotherhood, doesn't it? Doesn't yeah. It? It, it, of course, it, we it, should we should include yeah. sisterhood in, in the notion of, of course, not of course. Sexist, yeah. But but uh, but brotherhood, uh, you know, this notion of brotherhood um, is quite it, it has, has been has been reduced to that or or. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I I you know, there's people that I can sit like I, I well before COVID, I used to do role playing games, and you know, you have your role playing buddies. Yeah, like you go in there and you have this fun thing. You do it together, and it's great, right? But that's that, that's it. It's it's organized around the the pleasure of a shared activity. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, drinking beer with somebody at a football game is is an instance of that. But that's not the same thing as like fellowship, like you're saying when you go to church. And what happens? I mean, they, we the, it's an archaic term now. I, but when I was growing up and in church, we used to use the term edification. 
like edifice, like building a building. We were engaged yeah. in the project of building each other up in the Christian life. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things, so taking what both of you have said and maybe just t- t- viewing it from then from a slightly different vantage, one thing then, one property that we can use to distinguish one kind from the other. First, as you said, John, that one is what we might call a real or authentic friendship. Again, not a definition, just a property is that it is not contingent on a shared context that is then repeated and reproduced. Yes. It is it, it rather than being reproduced by a shared context, it is it in and of itself reproductive of yeah, then the context in itself. which you can share the time. Yeah. Yeah. And so to me, that gives the feeling that what we what, when we say real or authentic friendships, they do not rely on the contexture of a predetermined world to find relevance and significance. Rather, they create and unfold between themselves that shared context yeah. and world yeah. that then that's becomes lovely. enveloping of all other things. Oh, that's good. That's, that's, good. that's good. why that's why when you're in the presence of a real deep friend, it truly does not matter what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. you can it's sit good. with them on a log in the woods, and that's enough. That's enough. It, 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 and to me, that's the difference. So that's, that's one thing. And then Chris, the other I is that. Pick up on that. That's really, of course. I, I find that's brilliant. I won't talk a lot. I won't say very much. I think that's brilliant. I think you've articulated and extrapolated what I was trying to convey with this idea of the love that emerges and cares for something that has a life of its own that's self-organizing. I think you, what you right. just said there was brilliant and articulated yeah. it perfectly. Yeah, right. Too, right. Also, okay. we can bring that to the level of, 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 you know, what I said in the beginning of culture, you know, uh, uh, Steal as the well culture. as just individual, uh, it's like that's how that's how that's how we create a, uh, a culture that is living rather than a culture that is just based on in these dead institutional yeah. forms. That's right. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, and 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 then the the second thing is that, and they're obviously they're they're interrelated, is that they're the the I'm going to put this in scare quotes, but the real friendship is is infinitely dissimilar from all other friendships. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It is incomparable to any other. It is, it, is a, it is a kind and not an instance, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It is not comparable to any other, right? So, you know, Andrew, you were talking about, you know, you have your, your people that you go to the pub with and drink beer and watch football. And um, there is a degree to which all of those friendships are similar because of their shared context. Yes, and it yes. is the dissimilarity of that singular friendship that marks it. And you know, it, if, it is, it, if it is a kind unto itself, rather than an instance of a kind of friendship, I think that also is one way of, of telling the difference. But that, that, like you said, that follows perfectly from the, from the previous point. Because mm-hmm. if it is a thing that, that is autonomous, literally, it creates, the, it creates the nomos for itself, it creates the laws and the standards for itself, because it is a auto, it is a self-making thing, a self-organizing thing with a life of its own. It's going to have that uniqueness to it, right? That's exactly, exactly. it has to be the case. I would argue. I think. I think it's. I think it's not just a, a related sequence. I think there's an implication, maybe even an entailment from the first point into the second point. That's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. I think you're exactly right. Yeah. They're not. They're not just. They're not just two independent properties, but they are. They are. One. One is implicated. By yep. the other, exactly. yeah, exactly. Implied exactly. by the other, I mean to say, yeah. And yeah. that would then mean, right? Why it's so, yeah. I mean, think about how that then goes back to your previous point. Maybe these the points are cons- uh, there's a consolation forming, because insofar, I mean, I'm doing this whole course now on the nature and function of the self, and one of the functions of the self is it's supposed to pick out uniqueness, right? Um, so insofar as I share properties with other people, those aren't the properties that pick out myself. Uh, and th- there's problems there with that. I'm, I'm not right. Uh, but but it, it, it's some idea that in some way yourself is that about you, which individuates you um, and, and which picks you out um, from other persons, mm-hmm. um, gives you what we call a personal identity, a biographical identity, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and and we, we sometimes transfer that to objects, like works of art have that kind of self, because, right, any, any painting other than the original Night Watch by Rembrandt is a fraud, 
right? Uh, and so, right? So, because so it's a unique analogy. language, right? I mean, yeah. if yeah. you have a deep, real friend, you, you generate a, a unique language together. That's it's, a great it's, point, it's, Andrew. It's yeah, nobody else's do. language, right? It, right. It's, you know? Um, and and what, what I'm saying is that unique language feeds back into the point Chris was making about so Socratic self-knowledge. It literally gives you the language by which you bespeak yourself, by which you can carve out and individuate yourself, uh, 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 right? In which you can, right? Ah, so it's a unique language, but it's also the language that allows you to communicate outside of, 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 of the bubble or outside. That's of right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why you speak. That's why you speak more fully and more truly when you speak into the ear of your friendship. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Because the ear of your friendship, right, which we might call that third entity, the the spirit or the geist, as as you and I have called it, John. Yeah. When you speak into the ear, because its ear is more resonantly comprehending, the tenor of your speech is the, the the breadth and the compass of your speech suddenly grows it's it's the totality of its reference grows more encompassing because its capacity for comprehension is that much more encompassing. you're speaking into an entire world when you speak into a, an authentic friendship and so therefore your 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 um you know your, your voice, your vocality takes on a resonance. The logos takes on a resonance and is able to self-multiply in that Heraclitan way that it is not otherwise able to do. That's the fecundity of, of the world that's created between two authentic friends. Right. And, and so what, I, what I'm saying about that is, like, they're, they're, I'm trying to get the, sort of the resonance there. And I like, in speaking to the depths, I have to speak from my depths. And in speaking from my depths, I actually make myself into a new kind of self. And this is the way in which I think the self, the suke is shared between two people, right? That process of self-definition is being shared in some resonant fashion uh, between two individuals. And it's to realize, and you'll like this, Chris, because this, I've been reading a lot of, uh, oh, what's his name? The guy who wrote the book on, uh, is it Fowler? Uh, on on uh, on Dialogos as midwifery, talking about Socrates and Jesus. Yeah, Stephen Fowler, right? Yeah, Stephen Fowler, and, and yeah. he's, uh, he's done a section on Socratic uh, irony, as seen by Kierkegaard. And so there's this Kierkegaardian point about the uh, friendship is a place in which we can deeply realize, and I'm loading lots of connotation into the word realize mm -hmm. that the self is inherently dialogical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, yes, exactly. Or and, and then to riff on that and put it even just in, in another pithy way, John, the, 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 the speaking between friends is how we learn to speak with ourselves. Yes, exactly. And that, that's, uh, I was just teaching a lesson um, in the, uh, on the, in, at the Saturday Sangha. We've gone through, you know, Epicurus, who taught that the greatest virtue, of course, is friendship. And then we've moved into the Stoics and Antisthenes, you know, coming out of Socrates. And what did you learn from Socrates? Well, I learned how to converse with myself. But he doesn't mean what we, he means we replace that stupid babble we do in our head all day long with something like Socratic dialogue in the affordance and the aspiration to wisdom. And yet, the, the, and that only in friendship is that possible. That speaking to the depths from the depths is like, yeah. there's something there. Um, and, and like I said, I, I, I think it's unreasonable. I think it's deeply unreasonable to expect that, to have that, that those many deep, and unique to pick up on your point, Chris. Deep and unique living relationships yeah. with very many people. Yeah, that, that's very hard. No, you to only do. have a few. That's the other thought yeah. that I was saying. Like you only have a few yeah. friends in the sense we're, we're we're talking here. Yeah, maybe a handful. And have a lot. It's not a. It's a quant. It's a qualitative, not a quantitative thing. Exactly. Right? It's marked it's not up your five thousand friends on Facebook by any means, or it's not even just like a lot of people that you know. It's 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 like. It's, it's a small amount of yeah. people. And, and crucially, to your point, Andrew, I think, and, and I, it's not even speculative because I think I've witnessed this. I've witnessed a lot of people um, who, who, who are without any. Yeah. And, you know, mm -hmm. like it's not, I, I think, I mean, I, I, I agree that I think we can only have perhaps a handful uh, of those kinds of friends because of, because of, how, because of how much air they and take that's sort of suicide, rightly. isn't it? When oh, um, you say they have very few, I think I just a, yeah. I felt that's just so tragic. That's the suicide of of, of being. Um, it is. Oh, that's a that's a great way of putting it. That's exactly. I think that's when you, true. When you abandon all friends and you're just this, you know, ship adrift, 
somewhere, you know, before you, you know, watching your, your computer screen. And it's, well, uh, I mean, that goes back to Chris's point about the, the person that you stake, you know, uh, your life against their death, against their despair. Hmm. I, I just finished reading with a good friend of mine, Dan Shappy, The Plague by Camus. And, you know, and running through it, I uh, mean, you know, the character, uh, he told me the character he identified me with. Uh, and then he was reading ahead of me and I sort of accepted. It identifies me with Teru and Teru's project. I've been talking, I've sort of seen that is my way of calling my project. Teru's thing is he wants to learn how to be a saint without God. Um, and and that, that, that's literally the phrase he uses. But what you see in the plague, and the plague, of course, is this, uh, I mean, it's, I think it's the book that helped Camus win the Nobel Prize, right? It's a beautiful book, masterpiece. Um, in some ways, I think it's a better book than The Stranger. Um, but uh, in the plague, the plague, of course, there's a, t a friend, it's so apropos of right now, there's a French town, it, it's uh, overwhelmed by plague, they lock down, they go into quarantine, etc. And of course, it's a metaphor for human beings confronting absurdity and mortality and that. And that, but what, what you see in it is exactly that. You see the, you see the friendships, the friendships between like Ryu and Teru and some of the other, the friendship is the thing that, it's amazing because Camus writes it so beautifully. He, he doesn't write it romantically. He doesn't, he, he, all, but what he shows, he shows that the friendships, that's the locus, that which calls to us and calls, calls to us from another's depth and calls to us from our depth in a way that preserves our humanity against whatever, I mean, this sounds trite, but against whatever the universe can sort of throw at it. I mean, that, that's the point. Like when I, when I hear about, uh, you know, some of the friendships that were maintained uh, in some of the deepest, darkest situations, like, you know, you know, in POW camps and things like that, and how those friendships like pr helped people preserve their humanity when nothing else does heroic individualism and all that stuff that, that all gets broken. That all gets broken. But the one thing uh, that undermines it, the one thing that is not undermined is friendship. It's, it's telling that in um, 1984 um, Orwell gets this because what he does, the most horrific thing he does is he ultimately undermines the relationship and the friendship between Winston and Julia. And that's when they lose their soul. That's when they lose their soul. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's when he loves Big Brother. Um, yeah, so he loves the it instead of the thou. He's, he's moved right. He loses. The, he, and that's the whole point of the party. If you re, if you read the book, you realize the whole point of the party is to absolutely destroy the possibility of friendship and fellowship, so that the only thing that's left is the devotion to Big Brother, and the market and the state are trying to do that right now. Yeah, and that's what you're pointing to, Andrew. That's what you're pointing to. Yeah. It also occurs to me that I, I had a couple thoughts while you were talking. One is that, um, that, uh, you know, this kind of friendship is, is not necessarily, um, temporal. Like you could have friends from books <laughs> or you could have yeah. friends that are, that, that are, that are, that have passed away or that you, you no longer talk to, or, you know, uh, you can cultivate friends uh, in all kinds of places that you could be alone and maybe, at times, solitude is more of a place to cultivate a generous, uh, genuine friendship than, you know, in the crowd. Um, yeah, I think that's a really good point. And, and also that it, it also seems that um, there is a certain, there's something about those kinds of friendships that are also both voluntary and involuntary simultaneously uh, i think that frankfurt, it's important frankfurt. to understand that too yeah, yeah. it's frankfurt it's frankfurt's uh, voluntary necessity voluntary decides, necessity is always a voluntary necessity that's you right that's it, right once you enter into it you find that uh, you couldn't you, you couldn't be without it right well, that's, uh, because then suddenly suddenly you live in a world in which it is presupposed yes exactly and and once you live in a world in which that friendship is presupposed it cannot be discarded <laughs> Right, because it, it becomes like, like it becomes a fundament of your being as such. I use those terms deliberately, right? Yeah, yeah, your being yeah. as such begins to depend upon it. And and it's not something that you can hasten into, you can't rush into it, and you also can't contrive it. That's the other thing. I think sometimes people think you know, there's something formulaic about people when they have convergent interests and perhaps personalities that would seem by else by all psychometric criteria to be oh, yeah. compatible. 
And you know what? Sometimes it just does not work. And that does, that's not to romanticize it necessarily, but there is something there is and must be deep mystery within the emergence of authentic friendship. Some, some of it has to remain mysterious, must always remain mysterious. I like that. And, um, I like the fact that you're pointing out the involuntary aspect of it. The fact that you, that's why you fall in love. And this, I wonder if you fall in love that that's actually philia, not eros, in, in the sense that you, on some level, because because you you develop a bond with a person, a creative bond with the person that 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 endures through time, and it, it's not merely a you know a, an erotic thing. It's, it's it's something. It develops more from eros into philia, or or something like that. Are you following my? Yeah, well, Plato talks yes. actually. Yes. Plato talks about a shift in, within eros itself. Uh-huh. He talks about like there's there's a kind of eros that's the consumptive eros. So right, you want to you you want to be one with something and, and you consume it. Yeah. Right. And then he talks about the pa- the that it, you can it can flip, and you can get this move where eros goes from being consumptive eros to being generative eros. And he says when we and he he gives the prototypical example of encountering beauty. And wanting to make more beauty. You don't want to consume the beauty so it disappears into you. That's not the direction. The direction is the other way. You want to make more beauty in response to the beauty you've seen. And then he indicates that that is preparing you for right the philia in the Socratic relationship. Yeah, and that's why you could be married for a long time, right? Because it's because it, you keep going with that creation of beauty. You don't. It doesn't end somewhere uh, along the way. I, I'm sorry. I just I was just thinking that you know. The, the 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 essence of the husband wife relationship, right, is is really is really about that. Is you know we're talking about friendship, but it's also the essence of the husband wife relationship. In, in, I, I think because you say your wife is your best friend or, or, yeah, or that, and, and, and and the reason you don't leave this person because there's so many other options is because you've 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 gone beyond that state where you can continue to to. Uh, continue to, to to create this beauty that you're talking about or, or or which isn't necessarily something so tangible or or and and it's also a, a unique language as, as we've been talking about right i think i think so i think the spells of relationship is different from friendship not because of absence but but because of excess i think the spousal relationship should have all three loves uh, uh, at least the generative form of eros definitely philia in both the friendship and fellowship sense but also agape. Um, uh, there's a sense mm-hmm. in which you're helping, you're helping to midwife, you're helping to give birth to that person's uh, aspirational self. There's a sense in which you're, you're, taking, you're, you're, doing, you're engaged in the love of creativity. Uh, and of course, the, the problem with that with an adult, right, is to not do that in any way that's patronizing or condescending. So it, it's precisely, I think, the eros and the philia that counterbalance that, you know, that pretentious, patronizing aspect, the danger at least of agape. But I think it's also agape that makes sure that the eros doesn't become consumptive. And I think what is mediating between all of them and keeping them going, like you said, Andrew, is philia. And, and, and so if you look at sort of the measures of long-term relationship, yeah, the philia seems to sense, tends to be central, but especially for long-term relationships, there's an agapic element into it. Like Chris said, Mm-hmm. You, you, the agapic element is you help, like you're a world through which the other, you give birth to a world through which the other person can come into who and what they are. And that, or, or to use it another way, Andrew, you, there's an agape in creation, a le- creating a unique language by which that other person can come into articulation. Um, mm-hmm. oh, so I nice. think, I think all of them, I, I, <laughs> I hesitate to speak like I have any authority about this because I mean I mean I, I'm in such a relationship now, but uh, trying to get uh, relationships to last a lifetime is not something yet I've succeeded in. So I have to bow to your expertise on this. Uh, but oh, no. uh, well, from, from from what I've seen and from what I've observed and from what I have good reason to believe I'm now participating in, and and from the research I've looked at this, I think if you have all three and and they shift around in what is prominent at any one stage in the relationship, right? You know, you know there's periods where um, the erotic aspect can come to the fore or the friendship aspect yeah. or the agopic aspect. Sure, yeah, yeah. And I, I think again, again, it, the degree to which, if that argument is right and they're interpenetrating, the degree to which we have denuded 
right, and diminished friendship is the degree to which the other two are also denuded and diminished, and, and the way they all relate to each other is also denuded and diminished. I think it's no coincidence that the people that only have, you know, Facebook friends have a tremendous difficulty having committed romantic relationships. That's not a coincidence. That's not a coincidence at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's also something kind of interesting in the, um, uh, incidentally, before I say this, you know, uh, all of, all of this serves to, um, serves to depict what is at stake in the loss of friendship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I know for myself, the, the, um, the quaking of that foundation, the prospect of the loss of a friendship of that nature and of that intensity. I can't, I can't speak to the spousal relationship, but if I can return it momentarily to the philea of friendship, the loss of which to me is such a, it brings a kind of existential stress that in my experience, very, very few things can compare. I agree. Um, yeah. Because when you're, you know, when you're, when you're, when your life begins to presuppose that foundation and begins to presuppose the reproduction from the worlds that are opened by those friendships, the risk of the loss of those worlds is tantamount to the risk of the loss of soul. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of to bring it back to despair for a moment. <laughs> it's funny. And that's why it is such a seismic threat, at least in my mind and experience, yeah. when, you know, even if there's no real imminent threat of the loss thereof, if there's even a sort of a real disruption to the foundation of those worlds, the, um, I think the consequences... The, the existential consequences of that and the follow-up from that can be incredibly pernicious and deleterious to, to the living of, to the lived life. And, um, and understanding the, and understanding those stakes, I think is very, very important to the treatment of those friendships, you know, because it helps to make sure that in treating those friendships, you are not treating them as mere, you know, we're, we're treating them duly as the worlds they are. And, um, and, and, and often, you know, Sometimes, too, friendships, to, to take your point about the consumptive eros, John, and how, you know, the, consum the, the difference between the consumptive eros and the generative eros, that very difference often is, 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 is the difference that makes for a barren world or a fruitful world mm -hmm. in the soil of that friendship. You know, I've, I've hit moments in my life where I've realized that a friend whom I cherished very deeply was in fact my, what was, what was driving my, the need I had that drove my pursuit of that friendship was of a consumptive erotic nature. And of course I mean erotic in the broader sense, not in the sexual yeah. sense, right? Yeah. But there was, a, there was a consumptive eros that was actually an unconscious determinant yeah. of the I relevance of that it. friendship to me. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm sure. Yeah, I we, I know we, we many of us. have that experience. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Like everybody goes through that. Uh, it's you like have almost to, like we have a to threshold that you have to go through. And yes, I, I discovered this poem I wrote a long time ago for a woman. And it was just this barrage of sex and death and, and you know, every kind of <laughs> melodrama you can even imagine. It was just, it was just like pouring out of my unconsciousness. And, you know, we all go through that, right? And then, and then it's like the romantic has to die or something. In <laughs> I don't know. That's right. That's right. It's like that need, you know, whatever it is, that, that consumptive erotic need that can sometimes move friendships with a force that goes unseen to you has to be made opaque. It has, right? It's the transparency opacity shift that has to happen. You have to become conscious and aware. That's yeah. why it's meiotic and sometimes it's you almost, have to become conscious adulthood. of the become, nature of your adult. need and how rapacious it is. Yeah. And, then, and then sometimes in so doing, it's almost like a sacramental process in so doing, a, a friendship and the and the 
potential of a friendship can be renewed in that process. It doesn't necessarily mean the death of a friendship. It can actually mean the renewal of a friendship and the reopening of the friendship back into the, the, the mode of I thou. Yeah. And, and when that happens, I find, especially if it's requited, it is such a profound experience. Yeah. And I was thinking that friendship is also in stages. Like, like uh, w- when you were talking, I thought of like the, the period when you, when, when things become tra- tra- translucent or transparent is when you become an adult uh, on some level. So yeah. it's like, it's like becoming a mature friend. Um, uh, it, it, there, there, there's, there's, there's a, there's a, there's an evolution to friendship. It's not, it's not a, a yeah, thing. Yes. I, yes. Uh-huh. I was, I was thinking, Chris, as you were talking, I was thinking about, because we often, uh, we, we've talked about the, the, the mythos around these perennial patterns. I was thinking about the vampire myth as opposed to the, like the, the zombie myth is the myth of, uh, you know, well, we've argued with, with Philip, the myth of the meaning crisis. Mm-hmm. But the, the, the vampire myth strikes me as a, as a really appropriate myth of, especially because of all the perversions of Christian fellowship that are within uh, the vampire, because the vampire is someone who sucks the life out of you. Uh, right. And the, and the consumptive hunger is, is insatiable, uh, not in the same way, not in the mindless way of the zombie, but in, in the way in which it, it is, I mean, the vampires are sort of the, the, the quintessential narcissists, right. That everything is draw, And that's why they literally have the power of drawing attention, right. You know, you know, the Bella Lugosi example is, is famous for that. And then I wonder if that's the case, that the vampire represents how we can deeply betray, betray by Leah. The fact that we have gone through this cultural movement of making the vampire sexy and fun, isn't that maybe a way in which our culture is unconsciously indicating what we've been talking about here, that it has lost the understanding of friendship because it's lost the horror of the vampire. The va- being a vampire is cool. You get to live for a long time and all that, right? And it's like, no, you don't understand it. You yeah, don't understand the, the vampires are all 20 somethings now, which is sort of the, the age of narcissism, right? When you're yeah. in your 20s, you're kind of like, you're self obsessed. You haven't learned to, you know, develop me, you know, you haven't, you haven't had enough relationships to, 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 to know what it means to, I don't know, develop. I mean, not always. That's a good uh, point. To, That's to, a very good point, Andrew. I hadn't thought about that. That's even in one of those horrible books by Anne Rice, but the idea of the perpetual, the, the, the immortality is also a perpetual immaturity. The Forever vampire. Young. Yeah. The, 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 sorry. What did you say, Chris? Forever young. The forever yeah, young. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Perpetu- the vampire. So is maybe also- the, the the little prince or the the Peter Pan myth and the vampire myth are the coming together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Adolescent and the uh, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. and the but forever young. The pairing the forever young with the living death is a very. It's yeah. an interesting pairing, John. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's 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 definitely um, sells a lot of you know uh, TV shows. On and that so, and, and the and, and and then the and the so the youth obsession of our culture. And the trivialization uh, that Han talks about so much in the agony of Eros and the scent of time and saving beauty. I mean, right. All of, all of that, the, the perpetual immaturity of our culture that then that would also feed into your point, Andrew, and also help another loop explaining why friendship is so radically tr- like t- t- trivialized in our culture. Because the twenty-something is supposed to be where you're moving from buddies to the real possibility of friendship. Mm-hmm. But if you're always in that liminal place, and if you're always, what you're trying to do is get whatever you can from it, yeah. the vampire. Then, 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 of course, you're going to be perpetually incapable of friendship. That, and that's yeah. that's a really horrific thought. Yeah. What would it be like? What would it be like to be? psychologically set your character is so malformed that real friendship the the friendship that creates these like we said this unique language where we're not just communicating where we're communing with each other what would it be like to not be capable of that what would that be like i mean i I don't i don't know what that kind of i think it's a kind of perennial starvation like that's how i think about it 
What? Sorry, Andrew, I didn't hear. Well, I said it's a living death. It's it's yeah. it's it's your one of the undead. The uh, yeah. un, you know uh, really because there's just nothing. It's your whole movie. Your life is a friend's sitcom. It's like. It's, it's horror, you know? <laughs> yeah. Be, be, because it's your, your, I think of the image of, uh, I think of the image of, of, um, I think of the satanic image at the, at the bottom of Dante's Inferno. Right. Right. The flapping right. of the wings, right. The, 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 um, the, the, the striving, but the modally confused striving is precisely right. what recreates the conditions of incarceration, right? Yeah. As he flaps his wings, he cools the world and keeps himself encased in ice. Yeah, and I yeah. think that that state is something akin to that. It's like the very, the kind of, the kind of the consumptive and rapacious form of eros that drives people to want to collect and consume one another is the very thing that keeps them perennially fixed and, and, mo and motionless really. insofar as they just, they, they can't, incapable of the kind of self-transcendence that would have them again know and be known prop in proper reciprocity with another person so that knowing and being no i mean that's the deep relationship then between philia dialogos and the cultivation of wisdom right if you can't enter into philia if you can't commune then you're not going to have dialogos. You're not going to have these conversations that take on a life of their own and give birth to new ways of seeing and being. And without that, then the possibility of knowing yourself virtuously, because when you know yourself, to know yourself virtually, uh, right, Chris, I think you even made this pun in one of the things you wrote, to know yourself virtuously is to know yourself in virtue of others, right? Uh, there, there's an there's there, there, there's, there's inherent binding there together. And so... Without, I mean, so without philia, there's no dialogos and there is no capacity for that kind of knowledge, the self-knowledge that makes us wise. So instead, so what, mm -hmm. so what you do mm -hmm. then, yes. right? You gather, you gather the likes, you gather the connections and you don't have any aspirational self-knowledge. You don't have any Socratic self-knowledge. You fill it up with narcissistic autobiography because that hole there is also missing. And so what you do is you're posting all the pictures Right, and you're doing all the things on Instagram, and you're constantly—it's so the, uh, sort of attention economy. Um, yes, exactly. Uh, and all you're, you're just, doing is constantly running yes. the autobiography. Yes, 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 yes. Except the autobiography remains literal autobiography, because one of the things—and and as opposed to you know, you know what that. So you know how when you have a when you have a friendship, an authentic friendship that you ha you've had for a very long time, shared autobiography becomes a way or shared memory, if I can put it that way, using it in the Augustinian sense of memory. Yeah, yeah, that the memory, The memory becomes a world in which to play through. The, mem the shared memory, the commons of the shared memory, becomes a world in which to, to, to make yourselves more mutually known, rather than simply to trace over journeys undertaken, the tracing over journeys undertaken actually becomes a way of co-mapping your, your sort of expanding reference for one another. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm struggling I to get this one out a little bit, but that the, the, and I guess what I'm trying to say is that the, the reliving of shared memory has to be a symbolic exercise rather than a literal exercise. Totally. It, it, it's, it's the memory of sati. It's not yeah. the memory of, uh, of chronology. It's the, it's the memory that brings mindfulness of the deep remembering of who and what we can be. It's yeah. an ontological remembering. It's an ontological memory. Rather yeah. than yeah. historical remembering. That's right. It's the, it's, it's the vertical. It's, yeah, exactly. It's vertical rather what, than horizontal. That's what Proust's whole, you know, opus was, was all about, really, wasn't it? It was, it was, it was you know, writing, writing down in minute detail the, the, the beingness that he had, had experienced in, in his life and... and Transforming that, um, yeah. Uh, tra transforming that in, in, into meaning in, instead of triviality, or, or you know, yeah. D d d you're talking about the remembrance of the things. The remembrance past. of things past, yeah. Yeah. Post, yeah, yeah. I think that's exactly right, Andrew. I think that's exactly yeah. right. I think, which is uh, why it's yeah. such a profound novel, right? It's, yeah, exactly. It's, that's, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it, yeah. It, 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 what it, it's almost like a parable. Uh, parables are things that look like narratives but actually undermine narrative from within, right? 
uh, so, because what they do is they 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 sh they they they, sh they 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 dislodge you from that horizontal autobiography and they set you into the ontology. So like the yeah. parable of the prodigal son is right. It, it like well, I've said this before that there's the, 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 the there's the tension between justice and compassion and and and, and between the father. Uh, the role of the father and the role of the elder son and the role of the younger son. And if you try to resolve it in terms of any one of these things in favor of any one of them, you lose your humanity. Well, justice should always plan. No, compassion should always plan. No, the father should always teach. No, the elder son should. No, no. the point is, and that's what Jesus is doing. And he and then he says, though, this, he does the typical Jesus thing. And the kingdom of God is like this. And you go, oh my, oh, <laughs> right? So you get this, right? But Proust is like that too, because what happens is, you, 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 you know, swans win, all this. You're reading what sounds like an autobiography, but, but, but you realize, like you said, Andrew, you, you realize, no, no, wait, the bottom drops out, and I'm not really moving this yeah. way. I'm moving this way. I'm I, yeah. like, he's exploring the depths of humanity. I had a, a similar experience when I read um, The Great Gatsby, right? Uh, I'm reading The Great Gatsby, and I'm reading this book, and I'm kind of frustrated with it, and I'm going along, and I'm thinking, what is it? Why is this book famous? Yeah, yeah me too. I, it's like, I thought it was kind of boring. Uh, it's this, like, well, here's this, a story. This, or, yeah, this love story. This is like, it's just this yeah. autobiography. It's just this bio these biographies unfolding about these indulgent people. And then you get to the last five pages of the book and it goes, and you go, oh my gosh, he hasn't been talking about these people at all. He's been talking about the American dream. And he's been talking about the collapse of the American dream and the corrupting us. And, and you get that you get that drop into the vertical. Uh huh. Oh, drop into the vertical. Yeah, yeah. But, but and so here's another pithy way of putting it: friends are ways they share and they afford the dropping into the vertical for each other. Yeah. Yes. Yes. W which exactly. is why there. I was going to say one of the things I wrote down was that it, there's a risk involved in friendship because you can you can lose a friend. Like it's and also a friendship a friend is is is, is not something that. It's, it's not a smooth operation, uh, to use yeah. Hans language. It's something that challenges you. Uh, yeah. In a yeah. Very deep it's deep. a labor. It's a labor, to go back to the midwifery yeah. metaphor. It's a, a labor. labor. And, and so, so, so I guess that's why it's sacred again, but I guess that's why it's also a, a journey. And yeah. I guess that's why it's also hard, a difficult, you know, it's, it's a, a tr it can be a trial uh, uh, sometimes. Well, every yeah. relationship, every relationship ends in loss, right? Every, I mean, you know, every relationship ends in loss. And, and this is where, you know, you, if you take a look at, because uh, I've been teaching all of them recently, you know, Epicurean, the Epic, we, our understanding of Epicureanism is, is totally off. Ep, Ep, Epicureanism, the, 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 it's about, you know, philosophical contemplative companionship. That's what, Epi, that's at the heart mm -hmm. of Epicureanism. And then, of course, uh, you know, and then, of course, within Stoicism as well. And they, and they both, they're both, they both venerate friendship profoundly and deeply, but they always do it in the recognition. That's what I meant about, that's why I was invoking Camus' The Plague, because every relationship ends in loss. Either the, re the relationship is betrayed or damaged irreparably, or the person dies, right? And, 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 and so the Stoics... The Stoics actually, the, the, the premeditatio, you're always supposed to remind yourself, sati, that every friendship, um, every friendship is, is, is subject to fatality in that way. Everything, even, your, even, relation, even relationship to objects. Um, but the point is not to stop because of it. Right? Yeah. The, point, the point is not to say, well, I'm not, the point is not, uh, you know, I'm going to pack up my, toy, my emotional toys and go home. The point is not, it's, to, it's, it's precisely the opposite. It's to and, see, and, go ahead. Oh, I'm just thinking that the opposite is also true, is this, the friend remains with you always until you die. You know, if it's yeah. a deep friendship, it, it that never leaves. So it's both those things are true. Yes, yeah. they are. Yeah. They are, and, that, and that's the point. And, 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 and even and if you have an antagonistic rela relationship with this person and you break up or, or you, they, they're still working inside of you on some level and they're still having their effect on you, you can't. You can't get you can't escape from a, from a from a real friend. I don't think. I think there's no. No, escape. you can't. You can't. And actually, it's yeah. that's almost very crucial. It's yeah. almost very crucial to the real friendship. It's, it's, that, it's, the responsibility is is there whether you decide to take it up or not, right? Yeah. I, I I've been I, I it's been my experience 
that once you love somebody and love, not lust or acquaintance yeah. or care, once you love somebody, you always love them to some degree. Yeah. yeah. I mean, so, I mean, and even in grief, whether it's the grief of rejection or the grief of loss, right? You, you, you still love the person, but it's interesting. You, the, the, the whole, it, if you didn't love them, it wouldn't hurt, right? That, yeah. That's the point. And also, you, you, you might even you'd hate them as well in some level. Like, <laughs> you might have hate for them, you know, and how they, how what happened. Yeah, you yeah, might yeah, still yeah, have yeah. that, and, but that doesn't take that away either. I mean, hate is. So the, the interesting thing about it is, uh, uh, um, so what I, what, what I was going to say, not that you interrupted me, Andrew, is, is Hey guys. Sorry, Angie, you dropped out for a second. I had a, I had a bit of a latency problem. Uh, uh, the last thing I heard you say was Jordan Peterson. Okay, so let me, let me make the point. I said okay. invoking Jordan Peterson is like in, invoking Voldemort. Uh, yeah. but what I, yeah. he, he made a point, and I, it's not his insight, but he made it famous, that meaning, what I would call meaning in life, is what sustains you when you're not happy, when you're not cheerful, when you're not content. Um, and what I, was, what I was suggesting was that friendship is the tutorial for that. Friendship is where we get the lived sense of it being worth it, even though there is going to be loss, even though there is going to be conflict. We get a deep... And so in the Epicureans and the Stoics, you get the sense of friendship as where you get, and I, I want to break this word up to emphasize it, where you get encouragement, where, because courage isn't just fortitude. Courage is a sense of the meaning of life that sustains you even when things are going horribly. And friendship is the place where the Stoics, and especially the Epicureans, thought we practiced that. We thought, well, and you have something similar in Buddhism, Andrew. You have the Buddha and the Dharma need the Sangha. You have the Buddha and the Dharma need the Sangha. And so I think that the degree also which... And you which have the people, spiritual friend, I think it's called, yep. which who yep. is... Who, you, you, you can't really go very far without that. You, you, yeah. you, you can't. And, and that's what you see also again in the plague. And so again, I think... And we don't talk enough about this virtue. I mean, we fall, we've fallen into a maniacal monologue about justice, not even internal justice, just social justice. Social justice is important. It really is. But justice and sophism have to be talked about, and so does courage. And the degree to which people are not capable, I'm going to make a prediction here. It's something I think we could actually test. I think the degree to which people are incapable of friendship, of a communing relationship, that we've, the kind we've been talking about here, is the degree to which they are not going to get practice in existential encouragement, the courage to be, the defense against despair, and or, therefore they're the existential cowards. That's a prediction I'm going to make. Yeah. Or the degree to which they are merciful on some level, right? I mean... Um, but, but, it, but those go together. Cowardice yeah. and cruelty. Cowardice, yeah. cowardice and cruelty are deeply interwoven and bound together. Yeah. They're deep. Well, you, cr cruelty yeah. always comes out of tremendous insecurity. That's why you see the cruelty of people like Trump. He's because he is such a fundamental coward, right? Uh, that's why he, that's also why he's incapable of real friendship, right? That's why you see the cruelty that he sort of espouses without giving it a second thought, uh, because those are bound together. Insecurity and cowardice, and, and, right? And cruelty are always bound together. Yeah. Well, it just occurred to me that justice, right, uh, this idea of justice without the sense of, without that sense of understanding what, what, no. what philia and friendship is about would lead you to be unmerciful and, and, and cruel and, 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 and shallow and, and, you know. So it's, you know, there was a song by Three Dog Night, which, which really dates me. <laughs> really Probably, dates you, yeah. Chris doesn't even know who I'm talking about, but you do, Andrew. Um, <laughs> I've heard hey. that, yeah, I, don't, I don't know if I know the songs, but... Well, well there was a song called, you know, um, it's, e it, you know it's Easy to Be Hard. And then there, there's actually a line in here about, you know, people who care about uh, justice. But, but, and the line is that they care about justice, but as you said, they're incapable of actual friendship uh, with each other. And I think I think mm. the severing, the se the attempt to sever justice from fellowship and even a sense of commonwealth and, is and ideology becomes the substitute, doesn't it? Like, uh, like yes. a negative, uh, the, the having of that. shared beliefs, 
Uh-huh. Basically, we just become we become propositional buddies. Yeah, we, that, we that also, song and there's a venomous venomance behind it, and and a, and a you know which which arises with it. That is you know it's where I guess the where the where the scapegoat thing mechanism kind of comes into into being, where where you want to. I don't know. You want to join together with somebody and destroy something rather than join together with somebody and, and create. If that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. Well, it's just, sense. it's just group vampires, right? Yeah. It's, it, it's like, it's, it's mm, group vampires. Yeah. 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 The mob mentality kind of thing. Um, and, and, and we can mob together with our words as much as we can mob together with our actions. Um, and, and that's problematic. That's why, again, I think the myths, I mean, there's a reason why, there's a reason why things, I mean, there's many mythic elements in things like Tolkien, but the Fellowship of the Ring is a myth that's running all the way through. Mm-hmm. And I think the profound attraction for that is for many people, it awakens and it helps them sati to remember how much they need friendship, how much they need it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. friendship in and of itself is like, it's like it's like um within yeah, wow. within the suffering of life. Wow, that's beautiful. Say that again. Um friendship cocoons the memory of the eternal within the intrinsic suffering of life. That's yeah. that yeah, that's it. So that's he just, Sam and that, Frodo on the mountain with all this, yes, you know, the, the exactly. world is collapsing around them. That scene, yeah. But, it, uh, but that's yeah. Uh, very beautiful, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. That was beautifully said, Chris. Well, that's it was exactly. just just taking all, all that you two just said and, and just trying to s- synthesize it in a sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's why that's why expressions of the the Sam and Frodo example is is so canonical for a good reason. It's incredibly moving. I I I've never ceased to be moved by it for precisely that reason because it's like a pure it's like a pure distillation of that insight. And maybe well, the Harry that Potter expression. T- maybe the Harry Potter books are sort of the opposite. Uh, you know, uh, in a sense, the friendships there are all about rebelling against the adult world or something like that. Or Maybe I'm wrong. I'm not an expert. No, I think there's. I think there is authentic friendship in in that story, but I don't think that the I don't think that the friendship is as um is as central to the story no, as I it mean, is in Lord of the Rings because it's the because the, Harry Potter is a messianic so, story. It's yeah, it's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's a messianic. So it's the death and resurrection of Christ, basically. Yeah. That's yeah. that's essentially what Harry Potter is, and that's why it's so it's so beloved because it's a very very thinly disguised. Um, story of Christ, but I still wonder if it's beloved for the wrong reasons at, at times. Uh, you know, in, in its in, in the way that the you know just the like what we're talking about is these little groups of people playing Quidditch with each other, and they're sort of like that. It reflects the superficial aspect, right? It's not doesn't have this sacred it, quality it, it, that Lord of the Rings I, I, does. Yeah, I think there there's it. I think Chris's point is the friendships aren't as pivotal because. It's the story is about Harry Potter and how he's a messianic figure. So it's basically Jesus and his disciples. Uh, yes, whereas, yes. In, whereas in the Lord of the Rings, the superpower of the hobbits is friendship. That's what uh, people don't get. Everybody else has fantastic abilities, but the superpower of the hobbits is friendship. It's friendship that time and time, time and time again, preserves them against the temptation to evil. Again, it's their friendship, and it's the and the Shire, right? It's that uh-huh. it's that, and the Shire isn't a nationalism. It's again that sense of fellowship, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And, and, and 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 the the Shire again, is a village. It's a village, and it's it's yes, uh, exactly. It's what the, the kind of communities I think that we're we're sort of, you know, uh, trying to create in the wake of the collapse of of civilization, right? Which, yes. Yes, the smart what village book is about, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, the smart villages, uh, future yeah. thinkers, the civium of Jordan Hall. It's yeah, all about yeah. trying to get the that back. But right, the the idea is right. The, what makes the hobbits the, the 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 beings that have the ultimate courage? There's other heroic figures. There's Gandalf. There's Aragorn. But the only ones that have the courage to the end, the, for me, the scene is when Sam lifts Frodo up because he can't walk anymore and he carries Frodo 
two, right? Yeah. Into the, into it's the, the heart it's of It's the defining, it's the define, it's the fulcrum moment of the, the entire story, I think. Yeah. For yeah. a good reason. Yeah, yeah, very much. Very much. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And again, it comes back to your point, Chris. He, he, lit, he literally bears Frodo up against despair. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I should head out, guys. I think that's a good place to uh, bring it to an end. I think that's a very good image uh, to circle around to. Um, yeah. But my, my time is pretty much up. Yeah. Well, th thanks for taking the time. I, I see you're you, you got, you're you're incredibly you know active and busy with uh, talking to a lot of people, and, and so I appreciate you taking the time. And, but I want, and, but I, but I want to do this again, Andrew. I find all of these reinventio sessions. Yeah, and I'm gonna rename like I, I I put them out as reinventing because I thought reinventio would just kind of sound weird and people wouldn't get it. But then people have been writing and saying, "What do you mean reinvent? You can't reinvent these things." It, it's not right. So it should be reinventio. So I'm gonna I'm gonna rebrand our, our our discussion as as reinventio. And uh, um, I thought that maybe like because I really love the subject of friendship. That the next thing we we could if we if we dared to talk about you know the the erotic or or the, the aspect of of friendship and love another time or the next time if, if I, I'd be happy to take that. Yeah, on. let's do that. There's so much more to say about there's, this. Yeah, there's just. Um, there's an endless amount of things to say, I think. But I, I would like to explore also the proposal, which has fallen off our cultural table, but it goes back to perhaps Jesus of Nazareth. It's definitely in Paul. It's definitely in Augustine and in Aquinas of love as a virtue. Mm -hmm. I want to real. I would like to really explore that because the idea it, we 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 like we have. I was talking about this in the. the the saying of this morning, right? How, how much we have lost, how much we perverted the sense of the word passion, right? We, we, well, we, we do things with passion and we use this word, not realizing that the word passion is related to passive and the Greek word is pathe, from which we get pathetic. Passion is the opposite of action. And, and we think somehow that the intensity of feeling is what keeps people committed. We look, because what we're actually valuing is people's ability to commit to an arduous, or long-standing task. You can't do anything without passion. What they're saying is you need commitment. But the ancient idea is what feelings are ephemeral, no matter how intense they are, yeah. right? What, what keeps people committed is a power for committing to the good, which is exactly what virtue is. Virtue yeah. is the power of committing to the good. Wow. And, and, and so to my mind, I was comparing the intensity of infatuation, I use this as an example, with what you were talking about earlier, uh, uh, Andrew, the virtue uh, uh, that, uh, that, that, that empowers you and encourages you to stay in a long-term relationship. And that's not an intense feeling. It's a virtue. So I would like next time, if possible, to talk about love as a virtue. Love as a virtue, sure. Sounds great. And, and uh, that's another thing to reinvent, right? Pa passion, yeah, wow. Love as a <laughs> virtue because because it, it means like so many of these things we're living in a time in, of inversion where the the thing what we think it means is actually almost its opposite right exactly exactly uh -huh. and you're right to note that we and this is Jonathan Pajot's uh, point about we live in the we live in the topsy turvy world we live in clown world we live in the upside down world the upside which down he world, says yeah. is always predictive of the end of an epoch end of a civilized end of a civilization uh -huh. it, it it speaks of uh, of an imminent death on large scale when all these things all these things have gone through some major inversion yeah i think talking about love as a virtue and talking about the inverting of of it's almost like uh, frodo and sam like the end of all things the inversion of all things let's talk about both of those let's talk about love as a virtue and the inversion of all things and the inversion of all things okay I'm, i'll write it down here okay very good oh my god oh, Th thank you. Thank you so much. I, I love these conversations uh, just to death. It just, uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's exactly. so great. So, I, I love them too. I think they're, I think they're life giving. Exactly. That yeah, they certainly are. Thank you, Andrew, John, yeah, of course, you. and yeah. both of you. Yeah. Thank, both thank of you guys. guys. Good night. Then take care. Bye. Bye.